I'm going to go ahead and get started now. Um, so this talk is going to be on exceptions in Haskell. Um, this is me on the internet, and uh, now you get to hang out with me in real life. Um, I've, everyone always wants to know where the cat is. And so I'm going to tell this in a recorded context, because the story is way less interesting than the cat would indicate. I was at a house party, and I didn't really know anyone there. So I was just kind of hanging out outside, and this cat walks up. And I start petting him, and I'm very excited about this because there's finally someone at the party I can relate to. And the cat just starts climbing up my body and then just gets on my shoulder. And I'm like, what's going on? This is great. Someone takes a picture, someone photoshops it. And now I'm immortalized in my LinkedIn profile photo as this guy. So I've been working with um, Haskell professionally for a few years now. And I've kind of um, been bitten by exceptions in various ways. And I'm going to share some of my uh, ideas on how I have been handling them lately and some of the trade-offs involved and some of the different ways that I've messed around with. So I don't know about you, but whenever I think of exceptions, it's kind of like this. Um, everything is blowing up and everything is terrible. It's not fun at all when you're running some service in production, everything is great, you're selling your employers on Haskell, and then you get a single line, oh, there was an exception, everything is blown up, sorry. So this language feature, no one likes it, everyone hates it. So because it's so bad, there must not be that many languages that have this. So let's look at some languages that have this backwards feature. Uh, Java has them. And you know Java has all the great features in languages that you want. And uh, Scala has it too. And you know Scala has too many features. So that's about what you'd expect. Um, but uh, Haskell also has them. Uh, and it turns out, a lot of languages have exceptions. The list kind of just keeps going on, and it doesn't stop. Um, so that's kind of weird. Um, if this is a feature that most people really don't like and find difficult to use and confusing, then why do all of our languages have it? So maybe it's a better idea to talk about languages that don't have exceptions and see what's up there. Um, there's a few that we have in common parlance today in programming, uh, and I'm going to talk about two of them. And the first is C, and uh, the second is Go. Um, neither of these languages really have exceptions that you're supposed to use. So how do they handle them? If they don't have exceptions, what do they do instead? Because, um, you know, there's no escaping it. We're programming computers. Uh, they're going to blow up at any time for any reason and bring everything to a halt. Exceptions give us a way of talking about this in our language. Um, so how do these programming languages that don't have exceptions do their thing? So in C, we can call the exit procedure, which will exit the program immediately. And we also have panic, which will do basically the same thing. This brings the whole program to a halt. Not a lot you can do about it. And Go also has a panic mechanism, where you give it a string, and then it just brings everything to a crashing halt. Um, Go has some mechanisms for recovering from exceptions, or from panics, sorry. Um, but it involves like deferred functions that execute at in predictable times. And I couldn't understand it. It was very confusing. And the docs are like, you can do this, but you really shouldn't. Please don't ever do this. So this is some fairly idiomatic, from what I can tell, C error handling code. Um, first, we create like a pointer in memory that's going to hold the result of calling this do something function. We pass in that pointer, and instead of returning the like meaningful value that we want out of this, it's going to return an exit code. And this exit code is just some number, and that number is going to um, be some kind of enum or some set of constants, and we'll check to see okay, was the function successful? And if it was successful, then the function will have mutated the result and filled it in with all of the information and data that we want. And if it's not, then we have to handle it somehow, perhaps by returning an error code of our own. Um, that's kind of awkward. It relies on mutation. It's not very, I'm not really enjoying that. Uh, and so Go has a different convention, um, where functions return a tuple of an actual result value and then the error. And if the error is nil, then the non-error should not be nil. And if the error is not nil, then the th 
thing should be nil, and you have to do this check every single time there's an exception and if, or, an, or an error. If there is an error, you return nil and then the error that was returned, or do something else with the error if you know how to do it. Um, so these aren't really like ideal. Um, they're kind of clumsy, they're error prone. There's a lot of repetition here. And maybe it's that exceptions, while blowing everything up, give us the ability to talk about failure in a way that non-exceptions don't. So maybe if we like get a little idea on the theory and uh, understanding of exceptions, we'll have a better time with them. So let's talk about exceptional semantics. Um, what does an exception mean in our like theory of language? When we're reasoning about code, what is an exception? So all Turing complete languages have a way to blow up at runtime in a way that will trick your type checker. Um, Haskell has this thing called undefined. And it's, its type says, for any type A that you pick, I can give you a value of that type. And the way it does that is it says, I'll give it to you in just a minute. Come back in a minute, and I'll, I'll give it to you. And it's lying. It will never actually come back and give you that value. And we can do this in Java as well. We've got um, this class undefined, and it's got a static method that has a generic type variable A, and it just loops infinitely. Every single call just calls to undefined again until you get a stack overflow and the program crashes. So every Turing complete language can do something like this. And this bypasses your types entirely. Um, in type theory, we call this phenomenon bottom. Um, and it's written with this like weird upside down T symbol. And you'll see it in ASCII as like an underscore pipe underscore sometimes when people are too lazy to type out the other three characters. Um, the interesting idea from this is that if I can take infinitely long to return a value, I can produce any value you want, um, which isn't super helpful. But that's kind of the promise or the theory behind it. Um, Haskell didn't always have exceptions. Uh, it did have a way to crash the program with an error message, like C, Rust, and Go. Um, but this paper actually introduces uh, the exception system that Haskell uses, or the synchronous exception system. There's an asynchronous exception system that I'm not going to get into today, despite being very cool. Um, if you want to get more into the details and like the real type theory of what this stuff means, this is a great paper to read, very accessible, uh, highly recommended. So that paper said imprecise, like a semantics for imprecise exceptions. And that, that's weird, because I've never considered what a precise exception is. So let's uh, consider a language that has precise exceptions, um, Java. I know, there's so much Java in this talk. It's not what you signed up for. <laughs> um, so here we've got our, our class boom, and it's got a, a main method. We assign a boom of x to the variable x, and then boom of y to the variable y, and then we print out x plus y. And boom is just defined as something that takes a string and then throws an exception with that string. So just syntactically like reading this program, do we know what exception it's going to throw? Yes, it's always, always going to throw boom x. We know that it's guaranteed because x as a value doesn't even exist in this program. We don't get to that point. We start evaluating boom, and then we throw the exception, and x never receives a value. And in fact, the Java compiler, I'm pretty sure, will warn and say, this is a ridiculous program. Like, I can statically guarantee this program doesn't make any sense. Um, so let's look at the same program in Haskell. Um, Haskell's got a thing called laziness. Which means that when we do let x is equal to error of x, the expression error of x will throw a runtime exception that just contains the string message x. And we can assign x to error of x. And then we can assign y to error of y. And we actually will execute let x. And then we'll execute let y. And then we'll get to print. Whereas in Java, we didn't even get to assigning the value to x. We just threw the exception immediately. In Haskell, we actually get to x and then y, and then finally to print. And in fact, we also get to plus. Um, 
And the question is, which error does this program throw? Yeah, you don't know. It's actually not possible to know. Um, GHC does not, GHC reserves the right to rearrange your program as it sees fit in the ways that it can. And so that means it might evaluate x first, which means that it'll throw the x error. And it might evaluate y first, which means it'll throw the y error first. So in Haskell, we don't really have a notion of a single exception that a uh, expression might throw. We have a notion of a set of exceptions that an expression might throw. And when you combine expressions like this, you take the set union of the exception sets of all of the exceptions in every like subtree and subterm of that program. So anything can blow up at any point for any reason. Um, and you don't even have any idea of which one it is. Welcome to programming. Um, while this sounds kind of bleak, in practice it doesn't end up being that much worse than any other programming language. Uh, so we're not worse off than like Java in this case, unless you want like stack traces, which we don't have those. So why don't we use either? Um, this is Haskell's either type. We've just got a left and a right type variable and a constructor for each. And Rust uses a type like either called result to do all of their error handling. And they've got some macros and they've got some cool syntax built in to make this more ergonomic and more convenient to work with. Um, and we should always imitate Rust. They do such a good job with so many things. Um, so why don't we do that? And the unfortunate answer is performance. Um, here is the monad instance for either, and the one for except t is very similar. This case and the um, access of the right end up turning into a, an if in the generated machine code and a pointer dereference. So if you decide that you want to have a like either thing for your exceptions, you're now incurring the cost of an extra if and also a pointer dereference, which is going to like actually really wreck your code. It's performance, if it's a tight inner loop, it's doing a lot of important calculations. Um, fortunately, there is a way to get around that. There's a package called monad ste. It uses GHC's st monad and the internals around that to give you um, basically an either that doesn't have to do those things. It pretends that it's in IO or ST, it will throw the runtime exception that you give it. And then at the end, you unpack it into an either. So you can have very fast code using this with a typed exception. Um, it's almost like bifunctor ST, if you want to think about it. Bifunctor IO is very hot right now. And this is bifunctor ST before uh, people were even talking about that. So yeah, follow uh, Carter Schoenwald. He's He's ahead of his time, for sure. So thus far, we've seen a bit of a whirlwind tour of exceptions and errors. And we've talked about how Haskell represents them semantically, how uh, other languages like Java compare, and how languages that don't have exceptions handle error cases. So at this point, the talk is going to get a little squishier. Uh, I'm going to talk more about my experiences and philosophy about how to handle exceptions in error cases, and less about objective facts about the world. Um, so up to this point, I've mostly talked about Haskell's runtime exceptions. Um, and I'm going to use exceptions now to mean any kind of short-circuiting error value, whether that's the left type variable in an either, or like an actual IO exception you're going to throw. Uh, I'm going to use the term exception for all of that stuff. So some of the trade-offs involved are safety versus ergonomics. Um, Java has a thing called checked exceptions. And checked exceptions are really cool in that you get to track the types of all of the exceptions that a method might throw in the signature of the method. So I think that's cool. But every Java programmer that I have ever talked to hates it. They all hate the feature a lot. Um, and in all of the Java code bases I've worked on, which is like a university project and one fairly small thing in my previous company, uh, the fairly standard practice was to like catch a checked exception and then throw a runtime exception uh, that wrapped that so that you just get rid of all of that type safety. Um, I don't think that's probably a good practice, 
So I don't want to say that's characteristic of Java programmers, but it is characteristic of my experience of talking to Java programmers, which is you know, limited. So if we have too much safety and the ergonomics aren't there, we're probably going to sacrifice the safety to get that ergonomics back. We're going to lose all that safety we gain if it's too difficult or annoying to use. But then if we don't have any safety, you know, no one wants that. That's also not any fun at all. So precision versus brevity is a similar dimension. We want to be very precise about the errors that we can throw. We want to be able to say, like, my function throws these two errors, but not like these 900 errors over here. But it turns out doing that actually requires a significant amount of boilerplate. We have to define like so many types. And if we ever want to like aggregate them, we have to define more types to aggregate those types. So what people end up doing is they just have this gigantic exception type, or they use some exception to represent anything that can possibly fail. Because that takes almost no code. It's very simple. It's very convenient to write. And another thing is specificity versus composability. The more precise and refined our types are, the more difficult it is to compose them. Because if you have like highly concrete type signatures, the types have to line up exactly. Whereas if you have more uh, polymorphic type signatures, then you have a greater chance of them composing if it makes sense for them to do so. So these trade-offs that I've talked about are basically the tension between Haskell's uh, I.O. exceptions in the runtime and using something like accept T or monad error, which tracks your exceptions in the types and gives you something like Java's checked exceptions. Um, so I'm going to go through how I have used type checked exceptions and some of the problems that I've seen and some of the ways to work around them and a rather unsatisfying finale to this section, which there's always a light at the end of the tunnel, but I'm not sure about this one. <laughs> so the pattern that I've seen is that someone says, I want to know about all the exceptions that my program might throw. And they make their custom monad transformer stack. And they've got the reader T going on, and they've got except T over IO, and they've got their app error type. And their app error contains all the things that can go wrong. And these types, these types can accumulate huge amounts of constructors. Like I've seen an error type that has like 50 constructors in it. And when you do that, you're basically dealing with string. Um, this isn't actually more safe than just like blowing up at runtime because you have very little type level guarantees that the thing that you care about is actually the thing that's thrown. You can throw the wrong thing with this and you can also catch the wrong thing with this. You have no guarantees in the types. Not to mention that we're still debugging I.O. exceptions because I.O. can also throw exceptions. We now have two error channels in this code. And two error channels means two ways to forget to deal with it, which isn't fun. So we can't meaningfully deal with all of the exceptions like this. And we don't really want to because it doesn't end up being safe like this. So I like to think of these kinds of things as possibility spaces. Um, this like blue thing right here is the set of all sequences of ASCII characters. And then that little green thing right there, um, it's mu it should be smaller than that, but I couldn't get the text smaller, um, is the set of all syntactically valid programs. So we've got this gigantic space of programs that don't even parse, and this much smaller space of syntactically valid programs. And we're going to zoom into that syntactically valid programs. And so here's what this looks like. We have one space of things that type check, and then another much smaller space of things that actually work and do what we want them to. But let's, let's zoom in on that one a little bit more. Um, so these possibility spaces actually aren't entirely overlapping. Um, there are some things that don't type check, but that work and that solve our problems. And the majority of the things that type check do not solve our problem. So, we generally accept that this is an OK trade-off because we're forbidding vastly more programs that don't work than forbidding good programs that do work. So we tend to find this to be OK, especially if the type system is more flexible, like Haskell's versus Java, which you tend to want to bypass. So let's talk about types. Um, a type is basically a means of classifying values in this case. 
Uh, this is the type of integer in Haskell. Uh, it's got a bunch of numbers. There's 1, 2, negative 500. It's infinite. There are infinitely many integers. And are the integers the right type for our problem? It really depends on the problem. Um, sometimes having the full range of integers gives us way too many values to represent our domain. Sometimes we only want to talk about the naturals. Uh, natural numbers start with zero, and they count up from there. Uh, they don't have any negative numbers in this type. And sometimes that's exactly what we need. Uh, let's consider these two functions on lists. We've got take and we've got length. So take in the standard library takes an integer or an int. And what does it mean to take like the negative take a lit take negative three elements of a list? Like it's just nonsense. The only thing you can really do there is like round that up to zero. But at that point, like you're basically dealing with naturals. So the take taking an int or an integer is much less specific and it doesn't exactly describe our type. The possibility space of what we can implement with this and what we can pass to it is much larger than what is correct. Whereas natural uh, forbids any problems. There's no way to go wrong if you're using the natural type with take. And the same thing with length. Um, with length, it, there's no way to ever get a number negative four if taking the length of a list. There are no lists of negative length. And the type of integer forgets that information. So if you later have some precondition that you need to check that the number has to be greater than zero and you use length on a list, you lose that type information. You have to do a redundant type check. And if you just use a natural, the, more, the smaller type that more accurately catches your domain, you don't get that problem. So this, we want to give things the smallest types possible because that gives us the most ability to deal with them and manage them effectively. So this is our app error. Um, we've got a function find thing that takes a thing ID and then returns an IO of either the app error or the thing. So in the types, we could have thrown in, in the either, not in the IO, we could have thrown so many failure cases, or we could have thrown too much money with a coin, or we could have thrown some HTTP exception with the HTTP exception. There's nothing in the types here that says that we've only thrown the can't find thing error. So when we go to handle it, we're going to run the action, we're going to get the either out of it, and we know that the we know in the way that we know the list isn't really empty, so we can call head on and it is fine. We know that the only thing that could have been thrown from there was the can't find thing exception. But we still have to say, oh no, the impossible happened. There was an error thrown that should not have been thrown from this function. And so with except t, we have basically the same thing. Like, we're going to handle the error that the thing wasn't found and provide a default thing. But then if you know someone threw too much money with a coin, we're just going to have to blow up because we don't know how to handle that exception at this point. And it isn't a meaningful exception, and it should not have happened. But it might have. If the compiler can't guarantee something happened, I'm probably going to make that mistake, probably multiple times. So we want to have more refined error types. Rather than having a gigantic constructor um, or a gigantic type with like 50 things, we're going to want to have several small types, um, ideally with the constructor name having the same name as the type name to make it easier to pattern match and catch. Um, but now what we can say is we've got uh, except t of can't find thing and an IO of thing when we call find thing. So that gives us the exact granularity of the type. We have a very specific error type now, and that's good. And too much money, likewise. We're going to take an account ID, and we might throw the too much money exception. Otherwise, we'll return the account that it belongs to. So unfortunately, while this solves the problem of the type being way too large to actually capture what we mean, uh, we can't really compose these easily. If we do this, we end up getting a type error um, because with except t, the error type has to be the same for every type in a line in that do block. So we get a type error that can't find thing and too much money are different types with this block of code. And that's really unfortunate because it means that we're gaining specificity, but we're losing composability. 
So with accept t, there's a way to get around that. There's a function with accept t, and that basically provides a way to project the function in. Um, and then you have to say with accept t left with one thing, with accept t right with another thing. If you have more than two errors here, you're probably going to want to define a larger sum type to capture all of the possibilities of this function. Or you're going to nest either's over and over again. Or use a fancy variant of like an open sum type, which is just nested either's again. But this ends up becoming a huge amount of boilerplate. You're having to write like these projections into a larger exception type for almost every single function that combines exceptions, which is a huge amount of boilerplate. Um, and then as soon as you start projecting into larger things and you don't like start handling those things, you lose that specificity again. Things become cloudy and murky and unknown. So there's one cool way to get around almost all of these problems. And they're called classy prisms. If you don't know optics and lenses, that's fine. Um, this is basically all you need to know for the purposes of these exceptions, is that we've got this function uh, preview and review. And preview will take a prism from an S to an A, uh, and then it will take the S. And the S is kind of like this large source type. And the A is some small type that might be inside of it. And so we've got two prisms. Uh, the, the convention with writing prisms is to use an underscore and then the constructor name. So underscore right up there is a prism that looks into the rightness of an either value. And if the value you give to preview of underscore right is a right value, you get back just the value contained inside. And if it is a left, you get back nothing. So review will take a prism, and given a smaller type A, it can embed it in that larger type S. Um, so if we say we're going to review with the right prism with the number 3, we'll get right 3 out. And if we review with the left prism with the number 2, we get the value left 2. Does that make sense to everyone? Awesome. Yeah? Yeah, um, that's not a real Haskell function. That's just like, I didn't want to write LaTeX on this and code. So, so what we do is we define a class as too much money. And we say that this is defining a prism from some larger type E onto some more specific error type too much money. And we write an instance for our too much money error class. And for things that actually just are themselves, the implementation is ID. So when we want to actually throw this, instead of throwing the concrete type too much money, we use review. And we pass that in, and that allows us to say, OK, we're not throwing this thing. We're throwing this general type that just has a constraint on it. And likewise, if we have something that is an instance of that type class as too much money, then we can maybe get the too much money out of it. So we have a way of like projecting into this polymorphic type. We don't know what it is. And we have a way of recovering the possibility that something that might have been projected can be recovered. It's basically what happens when we're talking about exceptions. So this actually lets us do something really neat. Um, the type signatures for our functions have changed. Rather than saying we have some concrete type E that is our exception type, we now have a polymorphic type variable. And we just mention in our constraints all of the errors that this thing might possibly be. So a fine thing, we just have that it's an as can't find thing of E. And with too much money, we say that we have an as too much money of E. So the cool thing happens when we go to compose them. Haskell's type class system basically works like sets. If you have uh, a set of constraints on a type variable and another set of constraints on another type variable, and you need to unify those two type variables, you just take the union of all of the constraints of both of them. They're the closest thing we have to type level sets. 
which is pretty nice. Um, but they have some unfortunate problems as well. So while this does compose perfectly, like that type is completely inferable if you, you know, turn off the monomorphism restriction. Um, but it is completely inferable. GHC will do exactly the right thing. And if you have um, the, uh, if you have warning on redundant constraints and your function doesn't actually throw an exception that you say it does, you'll get a warning. And if you have where turned on, that means your build will fail, which is great. It means that you get compiler guarantees that your functions don't throw exceptions that they're not supposed to. So we can even use MTL and type classes to abstract this out. So we don't have to be in except T specifically. We can operate in monad error and monad IO. And that allows us to be generic and arbitrary in the underlying thing. And that's super cool. And everything composes almost exactly like you'd want it to. Uh, unfortunately, this only solves like part of the problem with typed exceptions in Haskell. So remember the Venn diagrams we had? Uh, the problem that we had with integers is that our type was too big. Um, so this is our huge app error type. It's got a bunch of different error cases, and ultimately the application type is going to become concrete, and this is what it's going to be. And as we collect constraints from these individual functions, the only way, the only thing that can happen is they get more and more and more constraints. You just get a larger possibility of errors. But that's not what we want from errors. We don't want to just say like, oh yeah, this is all the stuff we can throw. This is all the ways in which our program can blow up. You also want the ability to say, I'm going to pick this specific case and I'm going to handle it. And now the program can't blow up from this case. So what we really want is a way to say that app error is this collection of exception types. And we can add types to it by collecting those type class constraints. And we can also remove types from it. So this is what happens after we've caught some exception types and we've handled them and we know they're not coming back. And um, if we can only ever grow the amount of exceptions that we face, we can't ever reduce it then that possibility space just continues to grow, and it never shrinks. And if the possibility space is sufficiently large, you might as well be dealing with dynamic types. <laughs> Otherwise, the type system is just like, yeah, this could be anything, and it's fine. That's, that's dynamic types right there. So the wish list that I have for typed exceptions in Haskell is uh, it has to be composable. I want to have a do block, and it just does the right thing. I don't have to use with except t to manually project things. Uh, the exception type has to be growable. So I don't want to just have like an ADT that has five exceptions and I can't ever add an exception conveniently. And it has to be shrinkable. I want to be able to be able to say I can remove cases of how this thing might blow up. Uh, and it has to be fast. Um, if I'm actually going to use this, I can't, thinking, I can't be thinking like, oh, this is going to make my app like twice as slow in tight loops. That's unacceptable. So PureScript uh, has a really, really cool library. Uh, if you don't know PureScript, you really, really need to learn it. It's basically Haskell, but with a lot of the words removed. And they got these things called row types. And they got row to list. And it's very cool. But this library does all of that. It satisfies every item on my wish list. It gives us the ability to handle specific types and guarantee that you have handled all types, or all types of exceptions. It gives you the ability to transparently add new types. Everything composes exactly like you would want it to. And you don't have to deal with lenses or prisms. It's great. Um, I've been trying to port this, a library like this to Haskell uh, since January. And I was really hoping that my next slide would be, and here's the library that's awesome and that's cool. But I failed every single time to try and get something like this. Um, someone inspired me at a speaker dinner. And I've been working on that, but it's not quite ready. Unfortunately, so sorry. So typed exceptions don't do what I want. If I can't shrink the exception type, it might as well be dynamic types. So let's look at dynamic types. Um, let's explore some of the ways we can use these in a way that's end up being safe and mostly convenient. Um, so here's some code that's going to blow up. We've got a function open file. It takes a file path, the IO mode of how we're going to deal with that, and it returns an IO of a handle. 
And the handle just contains the contents of that function, or the contents of the file path you give it. But the type signature is alive. There's no way that we should be able to return a handle for any given file path in any given read-write mode. It's totally possible that the file path does not exist. It's totally possible that our current user in the context does not have access to this file and should not be able to read it or write to it. So IO's type uh, technically includes the contract that it can throw any runtime exception at all. Um, so this technically does satisfy, and it says, like, you know, IO can blow up. But I find that unsatisfying, because that's also the contract for literally every value in Haskell. Any one of them can have an imprecise exception just waiting to explode as soon as you evaluate the expression. So because I don't like using error in pure code, I don't really like throwing exceptions for things that are somewhat predictable. So we can use a function from the safe exceptions package, or the regular exceptions in base, um, called try. And what try will do is it gives us, it'll take an IO action, and it will run it and try to catch a specific exception out of it. So here we're saying we're trying to open the file, and we're going to catch error, which is going to have the type of IO error. And to put a type signature on that variable, we need the uh, scope type variables extension. And so if there was an error finding the file, then we can print it out and say, hey, this is the error, this is the problem that's happening, we can deal with this. But if we get a right handle back, then we're fine. So we can interact with runtime exceptions in much the same way as basically any other programming language. Uh, we have catch, try, finally, um, and try with resource thing that we call bracket. So the vocabulary that we have for dealing with exceptions in Haskell is basically the same thing as you're used to in any other language. The way you usually end up seeing this stuff written out is we'll say we have some action, and then we'll use catch as an infix operator, and then we'll give it a lambda, and that lambda will say the type of the exception we're trying to catch, and then we handle that specifically. Um, finally, I often see used in the same way as an infix operator, and you'll say finally do, and then you have this stuff that runs even if an exception is thrown. It will always run. Yeah, there's pretty much nothing that will cause it not to run, except for um, POSIX signals. I thought those were handled with async exceptions, because it seems like a classic fit for it. But uh, POSIX signals bypass async exceptions entirely, unfortunately. And uh, bracket is great, because it takes three arguments. Uh, we have one argument that will acquire some resource. And then we have the next two arguments. The next one is a cleanup. And what that will do is that will take the resource that was acquired, and that will be the finalizer that runs whether or not there was an exception thrown in the initial thing. And then finally, you have another thing that actually uses the resource that was acquired. So this is a safe way to acquire stuff in the presence of exceptions in Haskell. So with try and catch, uh, the Haskell runtime actually uses the types of the exceptions to figure out what it needs to catch, um, which is kind of weird, right? Like catch, what is the type of catch? It's a thing that takes as a second argument a function from some type e that you get to choose. And based on the type that you choose, it knows what to catch. That's kind of weird, because Haskell doesn't keep runtime type information, right? Well, kind of. We have a way to get that. Uh, it's called the typable class. And that gives us the runtime type information that you might use in something like, uh, like Java's reflection, if you wanted to. And so <clears throat> this is basically an implementation of GHC's runtime exceptions that fits on a slide. Um, that top thing, this is somewhat advanced Haskell features up here. So if you don't understand it, it's fine. Um, but we have the first thing up top is that any exception type. And this is a gadget. Um, and the cool thing about gadgets is that you can hide types inside of them. And you can also hide type class dictionaries inside of them. And when we pattern match on that constructor, it'll have one field, that E type. And when we pattern match on it, like we do down here, we can bring into scope both the value and the type of that thing. Now, the only thing we know about that type is that it has a uh, typable dictionary <coughs> or a typable instance. 
So when we throw an exception like this, we just say we're going to package the E value inside of the any exception type. And then we put it in the left of a constructor. Now when we go to try it, what we have to do is we have to look at the action that we've been given. It's in either of any exception of A. And what we're saying is we think we know what's inside of it. Now if there was no error inside of that any exception, then we're just going to return the A, the right of right of A. If there is an exception in the left branch, we pattern match on it. We bring both the value error into scope along with the type thrown. And then we use a function from the data.typable module, which gives us type equality at runtime. And we say, we're going to call eek t, and we're going to use Haskell's type application syntax, which is that at symbol. And we're going to say at error, at thrown. What eek t returns is a maybe of the proof that the two types are equal. And if we get a nothing, what that means is that those two types were not equal. And that means that we guessed wrong. And so what we have to return is a left of any exception. We still don't know what it is. We've hidden that type variable back inside the any exception constructor. But if we get just the proof that they're the same type back, then we return right with left of that error. We've refined the type, and we now know what it is at runtime. And that allows us to say, yes, we've caught the one thing in the type. And that's basically how Haskell's runtime exceptions work. Um, so Haskell's exception system really feels like a prank sometimes. Um, we're, we're programming in like a purely functional, statically typed programming language that gets rid of subtyping because it messes up type inference and easy reasoning about functions and code and types. And then we give it an exception system that is basically dynamically typed. Uh, it uses subtypes and inheritance pretty strongly and none of it's tracking the types. It's almost like the diametrically opposed thing that I would expect for Haskell's exception system to be. But it's basically like exactly what every single object-oriented programming language has, um, you know, except for stack traces. Who needs those? So I'm going to share some of my uh, best practices for dealing with exceptions. And uh, by best practices, I just mean like some opinions that I have. Um, they're mostly informed by like the scar tissue that I've developed trying to debug exceptions in Haskell, because you know without stack traces it's hard. So don't. Just when you think about throwing an exception, don't. Stop it. Try literally any other solution. Return in either. Do a maybe. Find some other way than throwing a runtime exception. You can usually get away without throwing a runtime exception. Sometimes you need to. But that's not the majority of cases. I think you should pretty much prefer to return either and allow the caller to rethrow that as a runtime exception, because that's much more predictable. And it's pretty easy to just like say, either rethrow pure. The next thing is not to use error or strings. I don't, I hate seeing an exception type that just has a string payload. That could mean literally anything. If you throw a string, you're basically saying the only thing that can possibly be done with this information is printing it out to the developer so that they can like use it. You can't ever really handle these things effectively because you're probably not going to write like a mega parsec parser for error messages that come from some third party library to get like useful information out of them. Or maybe you have had to do that and you don't like doing that and you don't want to do it anymore. Um, the next thing you want to do is leave comments in your things. If you're going to throw exceptions, like please leave a comment and say, hey, this is the exceptions that I'm going to throw in this thing. And use the Haddock link syntax so I can like click on it and go to the docs and figure out exactly how I need to catch that without having to guess too much. So we should be considering a pure variant of our functions when we write them to inform what exceptions or what things we should be using as IO exceptions versus the either type that we return. So in Python, this is the type signature of the map lookup function they have. Um, given a key k and a map from k to v, it just returns v. And they throw a uh, key not found error 
if the key doesn't exist. And that's what Python likes to do. Um, and I don't know why. It just seems weird. But they like to do it uh, for some reason. And in Haskell, what we like to do is we will say that that's a maybe. Um, there's really only one way to do this. There's really only one way this function can like fail in a sense. And that's by not having the value that thinks should be in there. And since there's only one way to fail, we can use maybe, and that perfectly captures the type. Either we get back the value that was in the map, or we get nothing out. So let's look at open file. Um, when we want to purify something, one of the things we can do is we can look at what are the implicit things we're grabbing from the environment and take those as function parameters. So the things we're using IO for in our function is basically getting the user's role and getting the file system. So let's represent the file system in a data type. A uh, file system can either be a file with a name, a set of permissions, and then a handle or the contents of that file. Or it can be a directory with a name, permission, and a list of file system. And we can say that a file path now is a list of these names. And we can traverse that directory tree to end up getting a file. Now when we look at this, it seems pretty obvious that there's a few different ways that this could end up failing. Um, the file could not be there. The user permission could not be right. So when we consider those, we get this. Um, a open file error has file does not exist, along with the file path that was tried, as well as a permission denied error. And we don't put any information in there for like paranoid security reasons. But now what this says is that the two most common cases that we would expect, even if these were purely functional data structures, have now been captured in the types. That's not to say that there might be some other I.O. exception that's thrown, but it would be an exceptional situation that we wouldn't anticipate happening just based on the types of the things we're dealing with. So this is a little controversial, but we've picked it up at I.O.H.K. Uh, don't throw exceptions that you normally want to return in an either. Um, and the way you can end up doing this is you can define an instance of exception for your type, and then you can give it, in the constraints, a type error. And so this is a type error from the ghc.typelets module. And it allows you to define custom type errors for instances, for type families, for functions. It's a great way to say, hey, you know, I need this thing to be around, but if you actually use it, like, this is the error that I want to display to the user. It's fantastic. Everyone should be using type error for all of their libraries. Uh, so this is another controversial one. If anyone wants to fight me about it, like, feel free. Um, an exception type should have only one constructor. And that one constructor should be named exactly the same thing as the uh, type. So I think this is bad. Uh, this is the arith exception from base. <coughs> And we have overflow, underflow, divide by zero, all the things that can go wrong in math. Well, most of the things that can go wrong in math. Lots of things can go wrong in math. Um, but the problem is that like plus will not ever throw divide by zero. And I guess subtraction will never throw overflow. So this type is like too large again. And if we say we want to handle a divide by zero exception, but none of the other arith exceptions. We can rethrow a arith exception, but then later on in the program, we don't have any guarantees that you know divide by zero was actually handled. We have to handle it redundantly, or not, and then it breaks because we've changed our code and we're no longer handling it. So this is what I would say the good version of this looks like. Uh, we've separated out all of their exceptions into single constructor types, um, and that makes it much more fine grained. And because they have the exact same name as the constructor, if I know the type of the exception, I know exactly how to catch it. I use the exact same like, word. I just catch overflow. Or I can give it the type signature overflow. Same thing. I don't have to look anything up. It's right there. And so I think the most important thing when we're dealing with exceptions is that we need to consider them a debug payload. When we throw an exception, and we get this back, this is like the worst possible scenario. 
Uh, raise your hands if you've debugged this before, because it's like nightmarish. You're just staring at your computer and you're like, oh, cool. I have one line of output. Something that talks to the network decided it wasn't happy. And now my program's done. I don't know where that came from. <sighs> when you're investigating something like this, you have to use like the old school methods, like reading code and like interactive debugging. And those are just horrifying. And so this is slightly better. Um, we have a payload now, but it's a text. And so a text can be literally anything. And it just means that we're going to print this out to the developer, and they might be able to fix it. And so that's not good. We really want to have more information in those types. And so this is good. Uh, this guy has the headers of the CSV that we tried to parse and failed. And it also has the row, which is the list of byte strings that we tried to parse and then failed. And then we have the thing that actually failed, which is going to be there if we failed to parse a single row and not if we had the wrong number of rows. And then we have the message from the underlying uh, library. So when you have an exception type like this and it prints out to your console, you can basically copy and paste it into a unit test for your code. And then you can immediately fix your program. And this is much nicer to debug and work with. So in short, an exception is kind of like sending a message to yourself in the future. So you want to include enough information that it's going to actually be a useful message. And you're not hating yourself for the cryptic thing that you've uncovered. Um, so that's all I've got. Uh, if you want to follow me on social media, I blog here. Um, I do a bunch of really bad tweeting right there. <laughs> I work for a company called Input Output, Hong Kong. Um, we are hiring a bunch of Haskell developers. So if you want to do Haskell for a living, full remote, uh, let me know. We do a blockchain thing. You don't have to know about blockchains. I don't know about blockchains. Um, but it's a lot of fun stuff. We've got a functional compiler engineer role and a cryptography role and a, uh, like a web API kind of role. And that's what I do. So. Cool. Uh, does anyone have any questions? What's up? So you mentioned on the slide around pure errors inside the I.O. Mm -hmm. um, that you don't want those errors to be thrown uh, when it's I.O., right? Like, you don't that type uh, literal. Yeah. I, I personally have liked a lot the, the Monathro approach. Yeah. Where that's a decision that is made on the call inside. Yeah, Monad throw is really good for that. So is there a way to accomplish that and have Monad throw at the same time? So Monad throw, when you do that with an either, will give you back a sum exception, Yeah. Um, which is basically a dynamically typed error. Yeah. Uh, and so there's, like again, no guarantee that it's actually the thing that you think it is. Um, so you can do that. Um, but it loses all of the information about what it was that you're actually throwing. Yeah. Whereas in either, um, you can really easily say, like, rethrow this either in I.O. if you want to. Um, and then if you end up having this type error thing, you can't use it with anything that requires an instance of exception, which uh, mon or monad throw does require. Yeah. OK, so the two are not compatible at all. Yeah, they're incompatible approaches. Um, this is, I'm not really sure about this one. Because it is really nice to be able to say, like, please rethrow this exception yeah. um, into IO. I don't know how to care about it right now. And I don't really want to deal with carrying an either around. So yeah, I'm not sure about it yet. Okay. Um, That's fair. What's up? Did you break out all your data constructors individually like you've shown? So you just have one giant. How do you deal with it? Ah, OK. So this is with IO exceptions. Okay. And so that's all handled implicitly. Okay. Um, you don't have to worry about the composition because it's not actually in the types. Yeah. Um, I'm working on a library that makes this nice, but it's the thing that I've been failing to accomplish since January. So in, in Elm, we, you just have tasks. And, yeah. And, and I'm dealing with the problem in the library right now. It's like, I want to be specific. I don't want to make it a giant error type, but I can't. I need to be able to post stuff. Yeah, if you're going to be concrete, you can like nest either, uh, or you can create like a, a sum type for every single function you do. 
Uh, but without something like PureScript's row polymorphism, I'm not sure that there's a nice way to handle this, unfortunately. Hmm? Question, so um, you mentioned in PureScript they have this nice library, and you, you're, it's hard to do it in Haskell. Could you talk a bit more about why it is you can't do it in Haskell? What's the difference between PureScript and Haskell? That's like Ah, so the question was, why is PureScript nicer for this thing than Haskell? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. It boils down to uh, row polymorphism, which is extremely cool and I don't understand very well. But basically, the, uh, we have this idea that we have these things called rows. And a row is a set or a mapping of a string label and a type. And it's a set, which means that the order doesn't matter, and also the duplication doesn't matter. And you can also say that I have a row type R, and I have these three specific errors in it. And then you can say, OK, this will unify with any other row that has those same three types in it, even if it has extra stuff in it. It's kind of like type classes, but it allows you to do more things with them at the value level without really complicated type level programming. <laughs> yeah. Uh, TypeScript has something like it, too? OK. Oh. I don't talk about that If I understand you, the row type as a whole is a type, and it includes a set of types within it. Yes. You can kind of get something sort of like this um, using Haskell's type level lists, and then pairing a symbol to a type, and then using insertion sort to make sure it's always sorted when you insert into it, and to handle the duplicates. Uh, but then you lose like all of the nice properties of like, this is a set, so when I do set union, there should not be any duplicates. The type checker can't know that, and it's not, not, it's not pretty. So you would use either tio dot dot dot. The io, if it failed, would be a mistake in your program because you're handling all errors in the either. Is that right? Maybe. Um, that's kind of a philosophical question. So either, like if you have either T, then that's the type of things that you know are going to go wrong. And then IO is the type of things that you maybe don't know is going to go wrong. Uh, and it also gives you two error channels for handling things. You might do throw M and throw it in IO. You might do it with throw error and throw it in the left. Um, so you can use the convention that you're going to have two error channels for two different things. But then you're still paying a performance cost, and you still have all of the other problems with composing types in the left side. So there's a lot of trade-offs, and only PureScript gets it right. Cool. Uh, any other questions? Cool. Well, thank you very much.